Good morning. Thank you very much. Right, so um, the study that I'm going to be briefly presenting uh, <coughs> this morning follows quite closely on the study that Channing uh, just presented. Um, but the idea now is to move on to unpacking this aid growth relationship. So just to be clear, the majority of the studies in the literature, and this literature has been going on for 20, 30, 40 years really, asks at the aggregate level whether aid increases growth. This is obviously a very important question. It's important because it speaks to that, what we might call a first order question of should we give aid? Equally, for a poor country, should we receive aid? So that aggregate question is obviously critical. But at the second order, at the more detailed level, it doesn't tell us, well, if so, if aid works, for example, and as we found from, Channing, uh, it, from Channing's uh, presentation that aid does make a positive contribution to growth, the question then is, how? Is it through health? Is it through <coughs> physical investment? Indeed, there are many possible paths that can link aid to growth. So the, the idea, the motivation of this study was to dig deeper, to open what we might call a black box uh, and identify some of those key drivers through which aid uh, is or is not supporting growth. Indeed, it could be the case that aid supports growth positively through some channels, but actually has a negative effect through others, balancing out, for example. There could be a net effect. Uh, so it's important to identify which ones are positive, which channels might be negative, for example. I think it's also important to say that growth is not the only outcome of interest. We are also typically interested in, uh, for example, from the perspective of the Millennium Development Goals, a lot of outcomes such as education, infant mortality, are seen as important in themselves, regardless of whether we're supporting growth or not. So again, this is an important area also to investigate. So we look at that as well in this paper. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we quantify the causal impact of aid on a range of final outcomes. Um, just to follow up a little bit on what Shanning was saying about the endogeneity issue, I think in a, in a simple phrase is that correlation is not causation. So if you find, and what we do find in the data, is that superficially, there is a negative correlation between growth and aid. But this is nothing to do with causality. So we do need to use these additional techniques to identify what the causal relationship is. And that is what we call dealing with the endogeneity issue. And what we do here is we look at growth and other outcomes, and I'll show you those later. And we replicate the aid growth result, but now with an extended data set. So now we're looking at 1970 to 2007. In uh, the paper that Channing was uh, presenting, we looked at 1970 to 2000. So that's an important result in itself, and we look at other outcomes. Secondly, we quantify the causal impact of aid on a range of what we call intermediate outcomes. An example here is the impact of aid, say, on education. And then thirdly, we pull these two together and then identify what are the transmission channels and try and basically disaggregate the aid growth relationship that we find. How do we do this? Well, not to go into uh, too many technical details. Again, we pay very careful attention to this causality problem. And so we do address the endogeneity of aid. The added difficulty of the disaggregation or unpacking of aid is that we also need to address, address what we might call the endogeneity of intermediate outcomes. An example is with education. Uh, education might be seen as caused by higher incomes. So people get a better education because they come from uh, a richer country. They have more access to education. It could also be the case that education helps you grow, helps you get a higher income, both at an individual level and at an aggregate economic level. So we need to be able to disentangle this 
reverse causality that might be going on. And that's why we need to use some technical, uh, some techniques essentially to deal with that. And we also, overall, we take inspiration from uh, the latest paper that Channing presented. And it's a long uh, cross-section approach. So we take lots of different countries and look at their behavior over, uh, over a period of time. So what are the results? Now this is what we're really here for. Oh, this is, this is difficult, okay. Strain my neck. What, uh, what this table uh, very uh, simply presents is simply a number of different uh, final and intermediate outcomes. And uh, obviously the outcomes are, are here we look at individually. And then the next column is, what is a baseline. And that's just the median um, of all the countries over the period of time 1970 to 2007. So this 1.7 here is the median GDP per capita growth rate of the countries in the sample. So <coughs> similarly, the, uh, the median poverty rate is 21.7. And then based on our results, we ask if th all these countries were given an additional 25 US dollars of aid per capita each year. So if everyone in all these countries were given this amount of aid, what would the outcome be? So this is really the difference between the baseline and the effect of this additional aid. So that's given in this final column here. And in each case, we find a positive, well, uh, a contribution that goes in line with what we would expect. So with respect to GDP per capita, the additional growth is about 0.3 percentage points. With respect to poverty, we find poverty goes down by a, a small number of percentage points. Interestingly, agriculture as a percentage of GDP goes down. And one might question whether this is a, a good result or a positive result. But typically, we tend to find that in the process of structural transformation of development, uh, that agriculture does tend to decline as a percentage of GDP. All this means is that remember that, that we find that there is economic growth. So it just means that other sectors are growing faster than agriculture. We also find that investment uh, is higher. And we find that average years of schooling and life expectancy at birth are also higher. So what we find, therefore, is that aid not only supports growth, it also has a positive contribution across a range of other outcomes. Now, this is important because it, it, it kind of builds on the consistency of this. This aggregate result, it makes sense that we find positive contributions elsewhere in the economic system. At the same time, it's important to notice that these are relatively modest contributions. So this builds on and reinforces the, uh, the point made by Channing that, that growth is a long-term cumulative process and, and changes take a long time to come through. And aid is only one part of supporting that process. Now we look at the disaggregation of the transmission channels. And I think the main results are actually uh, oh dear, right at the top here. And to make it simple, we focus on three main transmission channels. The transmission channel from aid to investment. By investment, we mean investment in physical capital, like infrastructure, roads, etc., etc., to growth. We look at the impact or the transmission channel going from aid to education to growth, and the transmission channel from aid to health to growth. Now what we find is that the, the first and the last two essentially explain all of the contribution of aid to growth. So the aid investment channel accounts for around 75% of the aggregate impact of aid on growth. The aid to health channel explains around 
of the aggregate impact of aid on growth. Now the big question is, what's happening to education? Well, what we do find here, which is interesting, is that there is a, a positive impact of aid on education. We saw that in the previous slide. In other words, that countries that receive more aid tend to show better educational outcomes. Good. The problem is the link from education to growth. And that's what we, d we don't find uh, a positive uh, effect. In fact, the, the table below uh, gives you the numbers, and it's uh, potentially a little bit difficult to understand. But this is the, the contribution of education to growth, which is essentially not distinguishable from zero. Now, this can create a, a host of, of questions. But let me tell you that this is not the first time that this has been found uh, in the literature, in the research. This is actually uh, an area which is highly debated. There have been a number of papers uh, by economists much more famous than I am that say, where has all the ed edu education gone? So there is a, a lot of debate around the, the contribution of education to growth. One of the reasons that we might be seeing this, well, not able to find a positive effect, is simply because the, the data we use on education is very noisy and it doesn't uh, reflect differences in educational quality. So a person can go to school for four years, but that four years, or 10 years, means one thing in one country, and it mean, might mean something very different in another country. But all we say is, how many years did you go to school? 10 years. And we're kind of assuming that this is the same quality, but in fact it's not. So and when you find, or when there are problems in the data, estimates quickly go to zero. So that could be an explanation for this effect, but we're not sure. So this is the, the, the table there. I won't go into the details, but that, that's just the disaggregation of the, of the different effects. So to sum up, so supporting the, the first presentation, we find there is a highly consistent and coherent pattern of results across, well, we heard about the microevidence, and now we've looked at the meso evidence, that's the intermediate level, and the macro evidence. It does add up. Once again, it's the cumulative impact of aid that's important. There are no quick wins. What we find from these results as well is that the internal rate, rate of return from aid to growth is around 16%. So that's, uh, that is a, a number which is substantial, reasonable, and uh, this kind of a rate of return is often used in the investment literature as to whether an investment is a, is a good deal. And 10% is often taken as a, as, a, as a kind of a benchmark. So 16% is... Um, is positive. Probably, uh, well, one of the main results are, is the disaggregation, and we find that physical investment and human capital are the main principal channels through which aid supports growth. But, just to, re to, re to remind us all, aid also is found to support other outcomes, it's just that there is a more ambiguous relationship between these other outcomes and growth such as education. Thank you very much. Could I just ask you uh, whether you said it's a data problem and very much discussed this link between uh, the, uh, whether education uh, mm. contributes to growth. Do you think during your research you will find sort of better data or more careful data so you can establish some connection? Because it's, it's a bit surprising that education in a sense does not contribute to, to growth. Yes. I. I think my immediate reaction would be that there is better data, there are better data out there. The problem is that it doesn't really cover developing countries. So that's one of the difficulties we find. For example, I mean, we're interested in the impact of aid on largely developing or low-income countries. And it's those countries where we tend to have the, the worst data in terms of educational quality. But it is something that we, we, we perhaps should, should dig into a bit further. <laughs>